Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Uh, really excited about today's show. Uh, we've got uh, David O'Keefe joining us uh, on the live stream and on the channel for the first time. Uh, really excited to talk about uh, his book, uh, Seven Days in Hell. I'm sure if you follow me on social media, you've seen me singing its praises for the last, I don't know, week or so, but uh, I really just did enjoy it that much. Uh, so we're going to just kind of have a nice kind of casual chat. If you guys have questions or comments or anything, please uh, fire away. Don't uh, don't uh, hesitate about that. All right. So, uh... hey, David, thanks for joining us. Hey, good afternoon, Brad. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming on. So, like I just said, you, you heard me there. I really enjoyed your book. We were talking about that a little bit before. Uh, it's kind of different than I would say what you're like, you know, known for, right? Because of the whole, <laughs> as you come over your shoulder there, the DF thing. Uh, anyway, I do have a yep. question about that, but we'll get to that later. Sure. Uh, but yeah, so this book, um, I got the copy here that I kind of got out of the library on a whim, actually. Um, <laughs> but I do want to get my own copy. So you seem uh, like you have a lot of notes there. Oh, yeah, but they're all good. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was literally at the point where I'm like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. Like, I want to mark it for later. Uh, no, not nothing bad. Trust me. I, I'm not going to uh, rake you over the coals or anything like that. So mm -hmm. kind of the you talk about this in the book, um, but I was just wondering if you could talk like start off because I think it's a good point because you start your book with it, like your connection to the Black Watch yeah. and the veterans. And I just wonder for those of you who haven't read the book, I think some people here have. But, but if you could just kind of run through that quickly, um, how you kind of got to this point. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I joined the Black Watch back in 1991. And part of it was because of, you know, growing up, my next door neighbor was in the Black Watch in World War II, um, not with the 1st Battalion. He ended up transferring to the Highland Light Infantry and landing on D-Day, but everything was Black Watch, Black Watch, Black Watch. So when it came time to join the Army, um, <laughs> you know, it was, it was pretty much preordained. If I was going to go into the Army, it was going to be Black Watch. And mm -hmm. when I went in, and this was fascinating because I was watching you yesterday on Woody's show and mm -hmm. uh, World War II TV, and you guys were talking about the Battle of the Horror. Mm -hmm. And I had joined the Black Watch not long before, maybe six months before Battle of the Horror came out. Yeah. So as you can imagine, when I walked through the door, there was a lot of talk going on about Varia Ridge. And Varia Ridge was not necessarily one of the better known stories mm -hmm. uh, of the Second World War, and it should be. I mean, next to Dieppe, it's our second worst day. There's a lot of controversy surrounding it, not like Dieppe, but there is controversy. Um, there was, you know, mutiny, massacre, heroism all along the ridge. Uh, it's an incredible story. It's, you know, it's Canada's World War II Vimy. I mean, that's really what it is. Um, so when I got there, there were still some back in 1991, there were still quite a few of the, uh, of the veterans left. And these were veterans from either the rifle companies and for whatever reason, there seemed to be more longevity with the scouts and snipers and mm -hmm. more of them started, you know, were hanging around. And I also found it interesting because the guys in the rifle platoon, uh, or who were in the rifle companies kind of hung around amongst themselves and the scouts kind of kept to themselves as well. And as I discovered later, this had to do with their cultural background and, you know, the kind of bohemian lifestyle that the, the scouts led, mm -hmm. but their job descriptions were different and in the post-war it kind of bled into um a, a bit of a division amongst the veterans not not horrible but they just didn't really hang out with each other because they had different existences and so i was lucky enough in 1991 when everything was starting to break that i was able to sit down as a young officer in the regiment and go through the archives which were fantastic and then sit down and augment that with a series of interviews, which went on formally, informally, casually. <laughs> I mean, and I developed relationships with some of these men for many, many years. One of them, Jim Wilkinson, I must have interviewed formally and informally probably about six or seven times over about a 20 year period. Um, and, you know, at the time I was putting together, I think it was my MA thesis, which was looking at intelligence and very Ridge. Um, so I started interviewing them at that time, but not specifically for the Black Watch. Um, mm, okay. I was looking at the larger context. Right. And then it just started to pile up. And, you know, by the time I sat down to write the book, I had a, like a 135 page timeline. And, you know, with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of material. And, you know, and then I augmented that with, you know, war diaries and message logs and after action reports and hmm. you know battlefield questionnaires and and it was amazing because it it provided this incredible 
um, spying, if you will, um, to, you know, have the oral testimonies play out. And so that's really where the genesis of the book came, you know, one extremely dark day, but preceded by an incredible, you know, a, a, a tumultuous six days up to that point. Right. I mean, and, the, and well, it's in the title, right? The, the seven days in hell. But I mean, the way that you've you've framed the book it, it, these days, it's well, it's very important how you go about talking about this, because like <laughs> that, those are the things I noted. Like it's not I just wanted to note the dates for my own understanding, because you talk about them coming onto Juno Beach um, a yeah. month after the, the landings had yeah. happened and then moving in and, you know, kind of that. And what do you have the inoculation period, as it's called? Yeah. And then getting ready, and then when things jump off with uh, with Atlantic, um, yeah. sorry, Operation Atlantic. For those who don't know, part of uh, Goodwood the push uh, to clear Con completely and push on south. Um, it's it, it's really well organized in that sense. Again, I know I'm probably just going to keep singing your praises, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it just makes like it, it makes sense to me in that sense that the the, the days are important the change of time is important because sometimes that can get lost right yeah well sometimes you know with this one in some cases it was very um i won't say simple but very straightforward i mean basically it's a linear timeline and i'm following right. as they go and i think that's important it's important for the reader because the reader what i was hoping to do was immerse the reader into the you know the experiences of these men um, you know, right. they do arrive in Normandy on July 6th. They do go into a period of 12 days of inoculation, which basically means sitting behind the front lines, sending out contact patrols, doing various things, you know, coming under the odd, you know, aircraft attack and shell attack or shelling, I should say. And, you know, they suffer their first casualties. But then, you know, starting on the 18th, late on the 18th, July 18th, as Goodwood and Atlantic are, are you know, reaching their apex, if you will, on the first day, that's mm -hmm. when the Black Watch are literally pushed into the deep end. And that's yes. probably about the best way. And then it's this incredible seven day run mm -hmm. that is unparalleled. And it's not just the Black Watch. I mean, it's the entire second division, yeah. you know, and you can imagine after being rebuilt, you know, uh, uh, you know, a Dieppe uh, or after Dieppe, now suddenly you're going from one massacre into essentially a, an entire week. Almost every single battalion in the second division takes massive casualties just mm. in these seven days. The foremost being the Black Watch, who end up by the end of it suffering 94% casualties on July 25th. Yeah. And, you know, throughout that entire seven days, they, they lose over, I think it's close to uh, 200 and something dead and almost 600 casualties just mm -hmm. in seven days. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're looking at something that rivals anything that any Canadian unit went through or division went through at Passchendaele. Oh, yeah. And that's something we tend to forget when we look at Normandy, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. And you, and you raise that in the book. And that's something that came in my mind, too, is, right, these are First World War, well, even, even worse, uh, rates of attrition, right? Because that's yeah. a part of this. We have some questions that I'll get to in a second. But yeah. I just wanted to say, like, we have this understanding, like you said, of, of Normandy in different ways. And I want to get to like kind of the American stuff later because it plays a part in this, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, our understanding of what it looks like and what that means and what attrition means. And again, there's controversy on pretty much all these parts, but there's not as big as like, like you said, with the app, but they, yeah. they still exist, particularly, you know, within the enthusiast community and military historians and that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it's, it's the, the attrition is the one thing I did want to say, like, if I had to do, you know, my, my book review, <laughs> formal book review, right, that's one of the things that comes through is this idea of this attritional warfare. And, and that's something that we don't think about in Normandy, which which is unfortunate well, because it's We so don't talk about it, and I think it's intentional that we don't talk about it. I don't mm -hmm. mean historians. I mean in the historical record. And, for instance, take a look at the euphemistic terms that Montgomery would use, right? Mm -hmm. He would use hit them for six, knock them out, do this, you know, write them down, tennis over the orn that Dempsey comes up with. Yeah. These are all incredibly <laughs> euphemistic terms for attrition. Yeah. Bite and hold from World War I, grab some territory, dig in, let the enemy throw themselves on you like Hill 70, yeah. break their backs, and move on. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but mm. after the ghosts of the Western Front in World War I, nobody wants to mention the A word. <laughs> That's basically yeah. What it is. yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah. It, it becomes like, World War II political correctness. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, well, it's all, well, you, this is like kind of an underlying part of your book because you don't talk about it too much because you're focused on, on the, the men themselves and the decisions, yeah. but th this kind of, 
and maybe this is going to be the first kind of commander bashing <laughs> that I'll do it, is this kind of managing after the fact. I mean, uh, like Simmons does that for so many areas. I mean, we could probably talk about him till the end of time, but mm -hmm. this idea of trying to manage what it looks like or what supposed things were happening and not happening. And and I, and I think that's important to, to also yeah, keep manip in mind. Manipulating the historical record after the fact. That, that was a huge concern. And to be yeah. honest with you, in all the work I've ever done over the years, I have never taken a scalpel to a particular leader yeah. the way I had to with Simmons. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I, I agree that he was like this throughout his entire career, right. but certainly in terms of what happened on July 25th, what happened in the aftermath of the war when it came to recording the history of July 25th, yeah. um, he went out of his way to meddle in the interpretation that C.P. Stacy and his historical team were in the process of putting together. And that had to do with a couple of things. Per first of all, it was his political ambition. He was trying to become the first chief of the defense staff afterwards right, or, right. or chief of staff. But also, too, and I think this is sort of where I've been kind of doing a bit of a rethink on this. Um, and I probably could have brought it out a little bit better in the book. Um, that Simmons, I would argue, is in part the way Simmons is, not just because of his natural makeup, but because of the click that exists, hmm. the two clicks, the cleavage, right, between the yeah. career camp and the Simmons camp. Yeah. And so, you know, starting in January 44, when Creer tries to have him sacked, um, basically on being high strung for psychological purposes, yeah. the war is on. And um, so, you know, when Simmons goes into his first battle, he definitely has Montgomery and Dempsey on his side, which counterbalances yeah. Creer. But at the same time, he knows that all eyes are on him. And so if he is going to fail or not succeed as dramatically as expected, he is going to have something prepared to defend himself. And mm -hmm. I hate to say this, but that almost seems, <laughs> in many cases, that was my experience in the Canadian Army. And I think there's a few others in the Canadian forces who would probably say the same thing. In other words, it's, it's not generally, uh, and I won't say this about everybody, but there has been a, a history of um, people being judged for less than professionalism, professional reasons. And it has right. to do with clicks and career building and yeah. everything else and permanent force click, if you will, or whatever it would be. Yeah, like, certainly sorry, colors with Simmons. yeah, it certainly colors it with Simmons. I think at the end of the war, part of the reason why he was so interested is uh, in not covering it up, but massaging it, massaging the history was part of his political ambition but also because he just couldn't stand for anybody else to be right. You know, <laughs> like he didn't want, he didn't want career to be right. He mm -hmm. just couldn't do that, you know? And especially when you have a guy like Fawkes who is now, you know, put up over him, but uh, maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves. Here. Yeah. Maybe we'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, but well, I was just going to say real quick, that's not limited to this at all. I mean, my work in Hong Kong, right? It's it's like a big part of it's the blame game, right? And who did what yep. or who didn't do what or supposedly, or the ones who died, they're the ones who did the problem. But anyway, we can come to that. So I, there is a question here I wanted to get to so I don't forget it. Um, but I think it's important to understand what, what that means. Oh, if you yeah. Know. The battlefield questionnaires. This was something I discovered in the archives uh, several years ago. I turned it. I you know I turned on Andrew Godfroy onto it, and then he turned. I forget who it is now. Who went out and used it and did a brilliant book. His name escapes oh. me right now. Robert Egan. Yeah, yeah. And these were incredible. These are uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. I think it's like a full archive box filled with questionnaires that were given to I, I believe mostly wounded officers. Mm -hmm. And while they were in uh, hospital beds, they were given a multi-page questionnaire, depending on their arms of service. And they looked at everything from effectiveness of weapons, what if impacted morale. Um, sometimes they would go in and they would write extra, you know, uh, after action reports, if you will. Like, here was my experience with the Piat. Here was mm -hmm. my experience with the two-inch mortar. And these were incredible. And I was able to augment the Black Watch story because I think I found about seven or eight of them from Black Watch officers. And it would run all the way from their experiences in Normandy all the way through to the end of the war. And it's the same thing with all the other units that fought in First Canadian Army, um, both in North, sorry, I should say more than that because it's also Italy as well. Right. And these are incredible wealth of material for the historian. And so those are what the battlefield questionnaires were. They were trying to get immediate um, feedback 
on tactics, equipment, um, organization, anything and everything. They were trying to assemble stuff for les lessons learned. So that's yeah. what the engineers were for. Yeah, they're like, I've only seen a, a few because it didn't really come up for my own work. Unfortunately, I wish it did, right? Because I don't have access to anything like that because it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I looked at a few for Normandy, but uh, it's it's an amazing source that really helps anyone looking at that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so the one thing I did want to mention, again, at the beginning, um, and your writing is, style is great in this. I mean, it really makes it accessible, but really, really... Mm -hmm. um, What's the word I'm looking for here? I don't want to say like not stuffy by any means, but like it's not dumbing it down. You know what I mean? If that makes any sense. Yeah. Really well, I'll be honest with you. I mean, one of the things when I did my Diet book, um, I, I'll be honest that my first three chapters were thrown right back in my face by my editor, Louise Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> Louise, Louise, is like the, the grand dame of Canadian publishing, right? And and she's you you can picture, uh, you know, she's almost six feet tall, and she's you know she looks like Susan Sarandon. <laughs> and you know with a british accent and she threw the first three chapters back in my face and she said this is you know impenetrable academic prose <laughs> and i said well yeah i guess i'm an impenetrable academic so that makes sense and she said look she said you can't write for the you know 25 other people who understand the app at your level yeah and i looked at her and i said you expect me to dumb down and she goes oh my god no she said you never drop the bar but you put steps in place for your readers to reach the bar. Yeah. And I just, I, I sat there and I'm thinking, you know, I was probably, I don't know, probably 44 at the time. And I just sat there and went, that's the best lesson I've learned in 44 years. Of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I embraced it and, yeah. and, you know, and I realized I'd been doing it for the longest time as a teacher, you know, I'm a college professor. So, you know, it's that, that period between 17 and 22, 23, yeah. and also working in television. Where, as you know, it has to, you know, the bar has to be set at a certain level, but yeah. the accessibility has to be there. Yeah. So I've, I've brought that trait with the urging of Louise into, <laughs> into my writing. So, you yeah. know, I certainly give her credit for pushing me into the deep end, if you will. Well, so. it definitely comes through. And and why I did want to bring that up, because again, I'm, because of, for those of you who didn't know, I'm sure a lot of people here know, but I was on World War II TV yesterday and we're talking about things like inclusion and, but also it was about Canadian military history. And Paul kept saying, you know, my channel is about Canadian history, but it's, there's other parts here, or you can, there's kind of this universal thing to it. And I, and that's kind of what I think I was trying to say with your writing is the way you explain things about say Montreal. Like I didn't grow up in Montreal. I grew up in Southwestern Ontario, but like, I felt like, Hey, I understand it now. <laughs> you know, I understand it better. Like you explain these things in a way wow. that someone who might know nothing can get it. It made sense to me now. Cause I keep, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm a Montreal Canadians fan and I know hardly anything about the Good. city. Good. You're in the <laughs> so, club. Awesome. So it's uh, it's just it's an interesting way of that's kind of what I was thinking. It's like you can explain yeah. these things because I know this stuff, right? Like I've been well, to Verrier myself, but it's just sometimes it can be a little, you know. Well, part of that is kind of going back. I mean, you know, in, in the beginning, I, I said, you know, part of this is a is kind of a tribute to the spirit of Ambrose and Cornelius Rodman. Right. And, you know, my the book I loved was, you know, Bridge Too Far. It was one I, when I was in the army, I used to keep a rat, you know, a ratty old copy in my, you know, and it was pretty thick, you know, and you'd oh, it's it a big one. Yeah, yeah. And you'd pull it out and you'd read a passage. Yeah, I got a copy time. somewhere back here. <laughs> yeah, now I'd be on my phone, right? I'd be on yeah. Kindle and whatever. But at the time I did that and it was just, it was one of those things where I always found it accessible. And when I went to Arnhem for the first time and I went and followed this, but this was back in 1989 when I was like 22 and the first time in Europe and doing the battlefield tours, mm. I just find everything really exploded. And I've never forgotten that mm. in, in the sense that, yeah, you could be reading stuff on a page, but you really need to be brought in. And, and you know, you, you, you have to be uh, enchanted and you know charmed and perhaps seduced by the area that you're talking about and that's right. what i'm trying to do with the you know trying to do with the with the reader is really get them in there so you know what if hopefully someday they'll take seven days in hell and they'll go off to normandy and they'll make the same kind of pilgrimage that i did with bridge too far stuck in my pocket you know well, with that said, I do have some links to buy the book in the, in the description. So if you haven't read this yet, I suggest it. Yes, I've always opened with, if you buy through the links, it helps me. But just get the book any way you can if you can't help me. Uh, so with that said, and this is kind of where I was leading with this, 
you, you start the book by saying, you know, there's ugly parts of history. Um, we mm. can't ignore them. Nope. Uh, like it's a really good passage. I don't want, I was going to say it, but I don't want to give it away because I don't think it sets a really good tone about kind of what you're trying to do. Uh, so this, uh, and I think I can ask this question without it because I'm kind of a fellow traveler in this area. You've done Dieppe. Mm. You've done Barrier Ridge. Mm. Are you getting, I think I know the answer. I'm just going to ask it anyway for my own peace yeah. of mind. Are you doing like the bad stuff that happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah, to, yeah, I'm just like, like, Yeah, that's I mean, what I'm, I do, I'm just doing disasters. I mean, I do Hong Kong. I can't judge. But the only reason I'm asking is because you you explained in the book like your personal connection, which you just talked yeah. about. But Diep, you said like, I remember reading that. You kind of stumbled on, into that too. Like, is this something you are hoping to do or is it just going to keep happening? <laughs> well, I think it's mystery. I think what gets me is, and look, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got, I think it was Steve Harris when I started working as a young undergrad at DHH. He just said, look, if you can't bring something new to the table, just don't bring it. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the case, because there's just too many trophy polishers, you know what I mean? Like we do this mm -hmm. over and yeah, over. Yeah. So unless, you know, if I'm going to do the app, it's going to be something new. If I find something new, then it'll be there. And it was the same thing with Verrier. Verrier was always a bit of a mystery. In other words, why were the Black Watch wiped out? What were the circumstances? Who was responsible? Things right. along those lines. So sadly, a lot of the big mysteries come with a lot of controversies and sometimes a lot of darkness. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the one I'm working on right now, which will be out in 2023, is dark. And you think the app in Verrier was dark. This is one that was, it's really something. It's not like I necessarily uh, search them or necessarily that I'm attracted to them because I'm not, you know, somebody who would watch Dexter or, yeah. you know, something like this. I, it, it, that's not what I normally do. Yeah, but for me, me I, th I think it's the mystery. Mm. For me, it's, I always think history is a mystery. We don't have 100% knowledge. And if there's something there that, that remains unsolved, I, I'm just naturally attracted to it. Mm. And you know, that's just part of my makeup. I've just, I've always loved that. So, you know, that certainly is, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sort of, you know, chasing, uh, you know, chasing tornadoes or anything like that, <laughs> you know? Well, because I've been accused of kind, of kind of the same thing. Like, why are you talking about defeat and, you know, all this stuff? And why are you trying to understand it in this way or that way? And I'm like, well, because we don't know. We don't, it's tainted and, a, and not in the defeat. I'm not saying they're like losers. I'm not saying that. It's just... No. It's it's a whole other set of circumstances. Well, history, yeah, but history totally isn't understood. supposed to be like sports, where there's a winner yeah. and a loser. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's it's about empathy. It's mm -hmm. about understanding what people went through, what decisions had to be made, what were the impact of those decisions, the rollout after. And, you know, I guess perhaps, you know, when it comes to tragedies, when it comes to disasters, I think the quest for understanding, the quest for empathy is perhaps maybe a bit more heightened, if you will. And mm -hmm. maybe that's really what it is that attracts me more than necessarily the mystery. I mean, I have a profound um, a soft spot <laughs> for people who have been through hell mm -hmm. and for people who have gone through things like this. I mean, I just, um, you know, the story I'm writing now, and I can't give too much away because it's a mystery. Um, and that's the way I'm writing the book. But it's it's kind of, you know, what would go through the minds of people in their last seconds of life? Mm. You know, they know the circumstances of what put them in that position of losing their life. Mm. And that's terrifying. That's profound. That's, you know, it's it's something that we all, sadly, we we all do kind of think about in one way or another. And, you know, certainly with writing Seven Days in Hell, that was the idea. The idea was to, like I said, take the take the reader and put them in the shoes of the yeah. men who were there. Not necessarily to, to, you know, turn them into heroes or anything else. That wasn't the point. Right. It was all about empathy, mm -hmm. you know? You know, seeing what other people have lived through and maybe it puts our world into a different perspective, you know, puts our lives into a different perspective. Yeah. And I mean, that kind of came through for me talking about, like I already said, like their lives pre-war and all the different things that these men were doing and all that stuff. But uh, anyway, so I did want to ask two things that kind of like at the beginning of the book. So the first one is about the Black Watch themselves. Mm. I, I got to ask, because you, you, you put this so poignantly, but I just kind of want you to explain it for everybody and in for my own peace of mind here. So it's a quote that I'm just going to read. So uh, hopefully you remember this chunk. So it's the Black Watch had two battles to fight. One against the Germans, the other against the proverbial albatross placed firmly around their necks. I was wondering if you could just explain what that means. 
Yeah, the Black Watch, and I always say this, the Black Watch is Canada's most storied regiment. Okay, we can, we're not going to get into who's better and who's whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's not the issue. That's not the issue. It really is the most storied because, you know, coming out of World War I, and I mentioned this in the book, they are the Montreal Canadiens, since you're a Habs fan, <laughs> of, of the Canadian Army. I mean, yep. they have the most Stanley Cups battle honors. They've got the most individual awards, right? You know, the MVPs and everything else. Yep. They have a swagger. They're mm -hmm. good. They know they're good. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact that, you know, the, the regiment itself, uh, the movers and shakers of Canadian society at the time, you know, Montreal yep. was the center of the universe before Toronto became it in, in Canada. Yep. And, you know, the captains of industry, politics, etc., were not only in Montreal, but most of them were Black Watch. Those were the mm -hmm. officers. And then the men were, you know, the working class kids. And so, you know, as a result, you get a very politically powerful regiment coming out of World War I that is paid for its reputation on the field of battle, which means very few people can argue with them in the post-war. But that develops an incredible reputation and a, a certain arrogance, if you will, kind of like the old moneyed families. In other words, it's all about the family name. Yeah. It very much was. And so by the time we get to World War II, you have the sons and the nephews of the men who earn that reputation mm. in World War I, who now place this incredible expectation around the necks of their sons and nephews who are going off to the Second World War. And, you know, part of it is that they are going to either replicate or exceed mm -hmm. the reputation that the Black Watch has. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're not just going to win the Stanley Cup this year. You <laughs> are going to win six in a row because the Habs did five in a row back in the 50s. They did four in the, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I get you. kind of out of worldly expectations. Yeah. It's, you know what? It's kind of like the argument over a Jess La Rochelle right now for the Victoria Cross. Oh, like, yeah. we have not given a Victoria Cross in 75 years mm -hmm. because we have made the Victoria Cross so out of reach. It's like saying nobody who isn't better than Wayne Gretzky gets in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, pretty much. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I get like, you. <laughs> and so these, this is the massive pressure that the officers and the men are living under mm -hmm. but the world is changing you know the 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 way that they fought in world war one some of the sense and sensibilities of you know charging up a ridge or over no man's land and dying in a very glorious way just don't resonate the same way yeah. the world is changing yeah. um the army is changing combat is changing the sense and sensibility not so much with the black watch the Black Watch are still hearkening back to that cultural upbringing. And there's still a lot of those overtones which are coloring the way it operates. And so that's certainly something that, that comes to play in the seven days leading up to, or seven days including Verrier Ridge, mm -hmm. is um, not only are they worried about fighting the Germans, but they're also worried about maintaining the mm -hmm. reputation and that, as you can see, plays into the deadly results. Yeah, I mean, I think that was kind of like an aha moment when you just said, yes, I, I, because I got the sense that they want to, yeah, there's the reputation, maintain the reputation. But when you said, you know, you know, exceed that reputation, mm. that kind of clicked a lot for me. And, and we'll get through, we're going to kind of, I'm going to try and keep chronological as things advance, because I just think it's the best way to do it. But I, I do want to come back to that. So and more this is more because it's in the title and it's important part of the book i was wondering if you could talk about the snipers just kind of real briefly because it's it's to me it's so fascinating because you keep like this bohemian different yeah. not i don't like i like using the word elite but like it's kind no, of like, yeah. elite is not really right and that's what i had to yeah. you know everybody's interested in everything being elite these days yeah um they were certainly different they believe they were elite without a doubt it depends on what they were doing i suppose um but what was fascinating and the reason that i i focused on them um is because a they were still around for mm. whatever reason somebody smiled on them and they were still around yeah. many years later yeah. also too they were the ones because of the type of job they were carrying out they were fortunate enough to survive very air so mm. and also the kind of role that they had put them in very interesting positions because they worked with the company commanders, the platoon commanders, the, mm. the battalion commanders. So they were proverbial flies on the wall, as I say in the book. 
And it, they have very interesting insights. They're kind of the glue, if you will, that sort of, mm. you know, that yep. oozed through. Yep. And so they were great to be able to focus around. Also, too, the Scout and Sniper Platoon as an organization was relatively new. This is the mm -hmm. first time that the Canadian forces are fighting with this. Um, they were always scouts and snipers, without a doubt, World War One and World War Two. But because of the success of sniping uh, by the Germans in Italy, the Allies decided in January of 44 that they were going to create. So by March 44, all the units in the 2nd Canadian uh, Division and Canadian Army were asked to all the battalions to create a dedicated scout and sniper platoon. Now, a lot of times we tend to think it's kind of like what you see in American Sniper, where it's the modern kind of sniping, yeah. where a team of two goes out constantly, they're out for days, they're taking shots at, you know, three kilometers away. Yeah. That's not what this was like. They mm -hmm. did do some traditional sniping, like you would have in World War One, where they did go out and sniper teams, depending on the nature of the fighting. If it was more static, they would do this. But the roles were interesting. They, they, they carried out all different types of patrols, reconnaissance, contact, listening, sometimes fighting patrols. But what was really fascinating about this when I started to dig into it was a lot of people don't realize that the scouts and snipers have this really important role in set piece attacks, which you would never even think mm. about. Right. They're almost like the old, you know, if you look at the Civil War, the kind of sharpshooters out ahead. Yeah. Yeah, And this was fascinating because as Jim Wilkinson, one of the snipers had told me, he said, like, we're human tripwires. That's basically what we're there for. Mm -hmm. we're, we're there to light up the enemy if they're out ahead. And so, for instance, when you're putting on a set piece assault where you say you have, you know, two companies up, two companies behind, they're advancing in box formation. You've got tanks firing direct on the side for support and you've got artillery, you know, coming down above. You're supposed to hug all that firepower and move ahead well the scouts oh and the uh the uh lead um platoons would be about 100 yards okay 100 yards from the canadian shells coming down right. um the scouts were asked to actually move out on the flanks and move about 50 yards ahead so they're only 50 <laughs> yards away from the barrage and that That's was intentional that. Because the idea was that as soon as the barrage would either pass over or lift off the German positions, the Germans would then scurry out of their holes and try to get to their weapons. So as a result, they'd be trying to get back to manning their machine guns. They'd be trying to get to anti-tank guns, mortars, whatever else. Mm -hmm. The idea was you would have the scouts out ahead and they would be able to bring down fire and pick off the crews as they were trying to reman their their positions which was amazing and then the other thing of course that they would do and you'd see this in the attack on uh, i believe it was on ifs um where if they oh, couldn't right. get the target themselves yeah they would carry flare guns very <laughs> pistols as they were called and then they would fire colored flares directly at the particular position for the yeah. tanks then to clue in on and hit mm -hmm. now both these things are incredibly dangerous to do. I mean, hugging an artillery barrage 100 yards away is something else. Imagine doing it 50. And then, of course, you know, you have to be Johnny on the spot when the Germans are coming out and trying to, yeah. you know, trying to man their positions. And then, of course, if you have to resort to firing a flare, you know that the flare is going to lead directly back to where you are. Yeah. So, you know, but this is not something we think about when we think about the scouts and snipers. You know, we always think about them, you know, like I said, like the American sniper kind of thing where yeah. you know, two guys in a hide somewhere. And they do do that later on, but yeah. not in Normandy. And I think this leads to a good part to put this in because you do talk about yeah. this in the book in more detail. So I guess we don't really have to do that here. But if you could just, the thing, because it comes up all the time, not necessarily just because of snipers, but the, you know, the Denison smock is like iconic yeah. and you talk yeah. about that's part of what you talk about. So if you could just like yeah. kind of briefly talk about yeah. what snipers would have. Would sure. Be. Yeah. The snipers and scouts, like I said at the beginning, were kind of bohemian. Um, they kind of knew they had their own culture. Um, their officer was really more of a coordinator than a commander, mm -hmm. whoever it was who came in Their You know, the real leader was their sergeant, Barney Benson. Um, and everybody keyed off him. But there were certain um, accoutrements, like you mentioned, the Denison smock, which is a derivative, if you will, of the paratrooper smock. 
Mm -hmm. This one, I think, had an extra pocket, a bigger pocket, because they had to take out, you know, sketch pads, pencils, rations for, you know, one or two days if necessary. And you wanted everything in packed tightly so you made, you didn't make any noise. Um, most of them would not wear their helmets. Their helmets would barely be seen except, you know, in shelling. Um, they always wore their, their mesh scarves over their heads or wrapped them around like a balaclava. And sometimes you'll see those iconic photographs. Yeah, I was just about to say, I didn't want to cut you off, but I think there's yeah. the, is it Fellays? Or Calgary, is it? It's the Calgary Highlanders that did a yeah, little there's, thing, if you will. Yeah, they're moving along a wall and there's a hole in yeah. the wall and there's the two there. And then it's basically yeah. exactly what you're talking about. So this iconic yeah. look that they have. Yeah. yeah, but it's amazing because, you know, it's little things that we don't think about. That That mesh scarf was made specifically to be able to drape over your head so you could then provide camouflage for yourself. Mm -hmm. But because of the mesh, you could see through it. Mm. You could see out and you didn't have to reveal your eyes. You didn't have to open up your face. So you didn't have to break your camouflage to do this. And a lot of people tend to forget this. And then, of course, as you know, as I found out, because we used the same thing when I was in the army, um, you know, they were great for anything and everything that you wanted. <laughs> you know, because they were great. They kept you warm. They would be your battle scarf. You put it around your, you know, your neck. Um, or better yet, when you're sitting in the back of a truck, you put it up over your, yeah. your face to keep the diesel out, you know, the diesel fumes that are coming out. And it also works when you're going to a latrine and it's, you know, there's 450 men who have been there before you, um, that also helps, you know, yeah. and so they used it for all different sorts of things, but a lot of times they ended up just fashioning it like a balaclava mm -hmm. and that became very, uh, much of a distinct, you know, badge of honor, if you will, along with their smocks. Um, when it came to the rifles, the rifles were the standard Lee Enfield, um, fitted with a sniper scope. There wasn't a special type of Lee Enfield. It was the standard one, but it was um, uh, hand-picked by the craftsmen. And right. then basically what they did was they, they took the, um, they took the uh, scope and they married it up, adjusted it before it left the warehouse. So you would actually get a finely tuned sniper version of the Mark, or what was it, the Mark? I forget what it was now, the Lee Enfield of the time, Mark Four, I guess, Mark Three, I can't remember. Three or four, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, three or four. Anyway, um, yeah, so it was all finely tuned. And then uh, what they used to do is they used to get the scope in a separate bag, and they would keep the bag, and then they would put it on, and it would be all finely tuned. And this, they'd have to, you know, they'd have to do this. And sometimes they would take the, the sniper scope off because depending on they were if they were on patrol, the last thing they wanted to do was get nabbed by the Germans with a sniper scope. Um, just simply because of the stigma yep. on both sides, you know, that was attached to, to being a sniper. But um, I, I didn't, I'm not sure if I put this in the book. I think I did. Um, after Verrier Ridge, um, uh, Joe Nixon comes in as the replacement scout platoon commander after Duffield is wounded. And when he comes mm -hmm. in, one of his, and this came up in the interview that we did, or I did with him many, many few interviews I did with him. And Joe said it was a riot because he, he shows up and he's told, you know, after training as a, a platoon commander, a typical rifleman, you know, rifle yep. platoon commander, that he's going to take over the scout platoon. <laughs> and of course, he has no clue what the scout platoon is because he'd been gone since 43 training and he wasn't around when the scout platoon was created. Yeah. So basically he said, yeah, they're, they're not with us. They're down the road a little bit. So he arrives, of course, they have their own, you know, carrier. They've got their own truck. They've got their own cook. Like, you know. And they're, they're, you know, there's, they're basically sitting there and half of them are undressed. Nobody's wearing a proper uniform. One guy is walking around in a straw hat. And as Joe said, <laughs> he's got no clue where this guy got it. But a guy, <laughs> another guy is wearing a Montreal Canadiens jersey <laughs> in Normandy. And this is like early August. And it, so it's, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Kelly's Heroes and Oddball. Mm. Boys, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a little bit of that. And that's what they were like. They always played to their own tune. And that was mm. fine. That was fine with the, with the battalion commander, fine with the company commanders. Because unlike the average everyday infantryman, where it's 90% boredom, 10% of a spike of terror. Yeah. Their job was constantly up. The tension mm. was always up. Because when the, you know, just because the unit wasn't in action or working, or in battle 
the scouts were constantly working. So the, the stress, the strain was a constant factor with them. Like they were literally workaholics. And they were, you know, sleeping at various times. They were working up around the clock. They were carrying out. They were constantly doing something. Mm -hmm. They didn't get a chance to really stand down. So as a result, they were given a, a very long leash. So basically, look, you know, they're, they're specialists. They do what they do. Kind of like some way that we look at special forces today. Yeah. Certain units where you're just like, yeah, don't worry about pomp and circumstance or even military discipline. They have a special job and they're very good at it and just let them do it, you know? Yeah. And I think this kind of where I want to go next, talking about, mm -hmm. I mentioned again, just the brief, um, you know, the chronological developments of all this stuff. Because I always think it's it's interesting to me when you, they talk about con, right? Because it takes forever to mm -hmm. get there. I mean, it literally makes its way into uh, St. Brett Ryan. You know, they're not taking con. So once yeah. it falls, right, we don't really pay attention to what that means. But you cover you cover this part of Atlantic where they're crossing the river. And yeah. to me, that was just so, like, hair-raising to read that. Because I mean, like, I like to have these kind of, like, revelations. I say, like, you know that. Obviously, I know they have to cross the river. I've never thought about what that actually looked like. Yeah, and you can give that in this, and it's just it's so harrowing that they this was their first exposure to combat, really. Yeah, it's something they were training. It's funny because I, I was watching, and I I know you and Woody were talking about this yesterday when you were talking about battlefields, and I was saying, "Come on, say barrier, say barrier." <laughs> you, were, you were talking about Falaise, and you were talking mm -hmm. about the Deep River, yeah. and the Deep and the Orin are not far apart. In no, other words, not. you know, where the Black Watch cross the Orin is essentially one of the widest parts, and it's about 30 feet, <laughs> or 30, 30 yards, I should say. Yeah. So it's about 90 feet wide. Um, but I think really what is the important part about this particular time is that the, compl the complete reshuffle of the German defense in Normandy. Right. Because between roughly the 9th of July and the 18th of July, you see a major shift south of Caen because Caen really is, you're not going to be able to hold the city itself. It's not strategically important. What is strategically important is just a couple of kilometers south, which is the very air Borgivis feature. That is a natural defensive feature. And so what you're seeing in those 10 days, roughly leading up to the kickoff of Atlantic is that the Germans are scrambling like crazy to set up a main defensive line just along the crest and on the reverse slope. And literally the entire focus of Normandy shifts. This is the entire defensive structure that the Germans have been fighting up to this point now takes a massive transformation and now sets up as a formidable hinge, but yep. still a hinge that is still it, embryonic. It's still mm. forming, it's still gelling. And with every single day, it gets stronger. So when the right. Black Watch kick off on the on the 18th, late on the 18th into the 19th, they basically are crossing through the Orne River or over the Orne River in Caen, and they are plunging into the rear guards of right. the German positions because basically the Germans are setting up about seven or eight kilometers of rear guards to give their forces time to dig in on Verrier and Borgibus. You know, yep. this is what they've been doing. Yep. So the Black Watch do go in, and this is a very difficult operation. They've been training for it, but it requires the cooperation of all four companies. Um, two of them are going to make the assault. One is going to carry storm boats, kind of like in a Bridge Too Far, where you, you know, you're going to mm -hmm. collapsible storm boats with motors on the back and everything else. And it's quite Canvas, the operation. Like it's, yeah. yeah, it's an incredible operation to be, yeah. to be but they drilled for it. And then the other company, a company, is going to be carrying what are called KPOC bridges. Um, so basically, it's a it's not a collapsible bridge, but it's a, a sectional bridge. Mm -hmm. And one man will carry a pet pontoon, and two men will carry a, a one of the bridging slats, or vice versa. And and then you have the two other companies. One will be a follow up exploitation company. So once a bridgehead is made, then the KPOC bridge is put uh, put down, and then it's leapfrog. The next company comes through. But the key to the entire operation is getting the one company that's going to provide covering fire into position on the river. So in case anything happens with these rear guards, they're in position. And I'm not sure if I should give anything else away, <laughs> but things do not go according to plan. Right. Yeah, we'll leave that one, I think, because yeah. I think it's, 
it's an important part of the book because obviously yeah. it's, it's about very rare, obviously. And, and yeah. cause that's done. But I think this part, I don't know, for some reason, things around the Orin always stick out for me. I don't know why. Maybe because of when I went there, it really made an impression on me. I don't know. But anyway, I don't want to, yeah, I don't want to go because it is, it's an well, important part to understand. If you go to this part of the Orn today, you can actually see the engineers, the tiny little engineer monument that they put up. Yeah. After the Black Watch crossed, the engineers came in through up a Bailey Bridge where the Black Watch where the Black Watch crossed, and you yeah. can actually still see that today. Yep. Yeah. You can it's... find the exact part, but I guess the, the significance of this is this is opening night for the Black Watch. Yeah. And somebody screws up, mm -hmm. and you don't screw up on opening night with the Black Watch, if you know yeah. what I mean. It sets a. Yeah. It's like well, it's, it's through. That's another thread. That's like okay, this went wrong. I don't know, it's kind of like in my mind, I don't know, because the 90s kid, the Jurassic Park thing, it's like the little things are yeah. going wrong. This is not yeah. going good. <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. It's all like gonna it's, yeah, it's all gonna come home to roost. It's yeah. just building up and this is not good. Once, okay, maybe, but like this is too many in a row. Anyway, so yeah, let's we can move forward because I want to talk about uh, just briefly, really briefly, because I know I don't want to talk too much about the operational stuff, but Operation Cobra and the American sector. And, and I, I I think it's pretty clear now, but I have seen some controversy about Operation Spring yeah. and like what it's meant to do. Is it meant to support Cobra? Is it its own thing? Is it supposed to be a breakout? Is it a bite and hold? Like, I know the answer. I just, I know it's a bit of a controversy around that. I don't think there should be, yeah. but it does still come up. Yeah, it's always been a bit of a mystery, largely because of what we referred to at the beginning with Simmons meddling at the end. You know, trying to, you know, he tries to tuck it in to also what's happening with Montgomery, because yeah. Montgomery is also trying to massage his own reputation based on what's happening. But if you strip it all down, what happens in Operation Atlantic is that there appears to be, despite the fact that the British are having a tough time at the other end of the ridge, yeah. the opening um, uh, days in Operation Atlantic seem, it appears, have ripped open the German defenses at the westernmost part of that barrier Borgivis feature known as Barrier Ridge. So right. to Simmons, being a corps commander in his first battle, which is August 18th, uh, August 18th, July 18th, uh, Atlantic, yeah. it appears there's a hell of a chance here that he could get through this gap and turn the flank. So I, I do not blame Simmons for making that effort. Hmm. Uh, plenty of blame falls on the shoulders of the division commander for how that effort is made, hmm. General Charles Fawkes, okay. and of course, uh, Brigadier Young, who's also responsible with 6th Brigade. They make the attempt to do it. The attempt, I, in my opinion, is right. You need to make that attempt. Yeah. But when that ends up failing, then you have a couple of things that are conspiring. First of all, the weather turns. Right. So you're losing air power temporarily, air cover, which is always not not good to lose, uh, yeah. not when you're fighting against the Germans. And also the German defense is congealing. So every single hour, it's getting stronger along Verrier. Um, and so when Atlantic kind of and Goodwood kind of sputter to a stop, yeah. the original incarnation of spring, and this is the key, a lot of people don't realize it's evolutionary in nature until it goes in. And yep. this is, I think, really what the key is to understanding it all. And I had a hard time getting my head around that at first when I first started <laughs> working on my MA thesis yeah. because I realized, I was like, well, wait a second, on this day it's this, and on this day it's that, and then it, ah. <laughs> you know, suddenly <laughs> I realized, wait a second, it really is different. And I was lucky enough, I was able to reach out to Simmons' chief of staff, who was still alive in the uh, in the early 90s when I was working, early and late 90s, Elliot Roger, and he was wonderful. And he wasn't interested in, you know, uh, you know, trying to, you know, support the reputation of the boss. He wasn't trying to rip it down. Mm. Here it is. This yeah. is what was happening. And it came out that it essentially was evolutionary in nature. In other words, mm. originally when they thought about it was like, OK, we have this great opportunity. We still may have this opportunity. Atlantic didn't go well. Let's continue the breakout south. And that was the term that they used. Let's continue to break out south and try to hit Falaise or at least move down the road. Yeah. But then as the bad weather came in, the Germans started to congeal. They realized, no, this will require another full set piece attack after a pause. So then, then we start looking at a change in Operation Spring. No longer is it breakout with exploitation. 
now it's a question of World War One bite and hold. Mm -hmm. Trying to get to Falaise is probably a bit more much right now because the Germans <laughs> are building up. And at that point, they're starting. Well, the, the, what intelligence is telling them is you've got 450 German tanks or assault guns on the other side of the ridge. And even though intelligence said, well, OK, let's temper this quite a bit, it still leaves roughly 150 to 200, even if they revise their figures, which right. is highly significant, to say yeah. the least. Not to mention two Panzer Corps worth of artillery, or uh, SS Panzer Corps artillery. I mean, you know, people tend to forget it's one of the biggest artillery duels. Mm -hmm. of the right. Canadian. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that, yeah, because you say it's more than twice the amount of LL Main or something like that. Uh, uh, close to, well, it's, it's certainly more when it comes to rounds per gun dumped, you right. know, on a particular day, which is absolutely incredible. So as a result, the picture is forming. A 21st Army Group, 2nd British Army, which is actually the parent. Uh, a lot of people think it's 1st Canadian Army. It's right. not. Nope. This is a 2nd Canadian Corps operation under General Simmons, mm -hmm. carried out under the auspices of Dempsey's 2nd Division, 2nd uh, uh, Canadian, uh, sorry, pardon me, 2nd British Army, British under Army. 21st Army Group. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cut that out. Um, so as a result, this is the mindset. And... You know, both Army Group and Army are getting ultra on a regular basis. Mm. Simmons has reading rights. His staff doesn't get ultra. He does. He mm -hmm. has the ability to go up and discuss it with with uh, with uh, Dempsey. Yep. So he's quite aware of how things are developing, you know, how thick things are becoming on the other side. And any hope of breakthrough is just impossible at this time unless there's an absolute miracle. So basically what happens by the time Operation Spring goes in on the 25th is it's been downscaled or not scale, not so much scaled down, but the the intensity of expectations have been downscaled. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting oh, it. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's this. In other words, we're going to use four yeah. divisions. We're going to use two infantry to create a breach. We're going to use the two armored divisions, yeah. the, the seventh and the guards to Guard. exploit it. But we're not going to try to reach Falaise. Yeah. <laughs> we're just going to turn. We want to bite and hold. We want bait. So basically, we're going to turn the flank of Hitler's beloved first SS, Leaps mm. and Dart. And we're either going to force it to pull out, and therefore we win the ridge, which is good. Or if it stays in place and the Germans try to counterattack, which is per their doctrine, yep. then we are going to be ready. We are going to take the ridge. We're going to dig in on the ridge. We're going to bring up artillery. We're going to bring up anti-tank guns. We're going to vector in air support. And we are going to wait for them to counterattack, just like we did, you know, in 1917 at Hill 70. And we are going to let them break their backs on our guns. Yeah. But you can't do that until you get the ridge. Yeah. You need that. And that's the bait. And so by the time Operation Spring comes in, it goes from, hey, breakout, to, hey, bite and hold, and we're going to poke the bear. This is about poking the bear by the time it goes in. Yeah. And it's yeah. difficult because you are engaging in classic battle. It's a classic battle of attrition. Mm -hmm. You know, you're baiting your opponent to come in because you want to kill proportionately more of him than you will lose. Yeah. And this is, at the time, that's not politically correct to say. No. By, the, by, the, you know, by the standards of 1944. You just don't yeah. use the A word. Now that, yeah. that that probably would be a good title for an article. The A word. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would be uh, get some uh, yeah. get some attention. Yeah, because you're, you're stirring up all the ghosts of the song, right? Yeah. Attrition is associated with futility. Yeah. It's you know of of wasting men's lives. The absence. What is it? The absence of strategy rather than strategy. Right. Yeah. Right. It's 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 in the book too, and this comes across in all kinds of sources on Normandy. But there's that. Yeah, maybe this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, but this not censoring is not the right word, but this playing down, I guess, is the better way to say it. Yeah, that's yeah, what we're trying to do. Control. Downplaying or dampening down. Or, yeah, because or deflecting. As you as you talk about, right, there's political elements to this. Montgomery's getting heat from Churchill because you, you you frame that really well because there's the visit right and then you you put that really well in there and then you go boom politics but uh well yeah, yeah. yeah. and this is the key a, a lot of us tend to forget this we just you know sometimes we we tend to be in our own little rabbit hole and we don't you know yeah. we don't think about it but by the time we get to 
you know, the, the 18th of July and that entire week, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on Montgomery and on Eisenhower. Um, first of all, I mean, you've got the British who are running out of men. They're starting mm -hmm. to cannibalize uh, their units to find reinforcements. Yeah. Um, there's a war weariness in Britain. The V1s are raining down. Everybody wants to get this over with, right? They're in their sixth year of the war. They want to get this over with. On the flip side, you've got the Americans who are now in an election year. Yeah. And we tend to forget that in the historiography. Mm -hmm. You know, election years are, are can be pretty nasty when it comes to, you know, expectations placed on commanders. Well, also and, because FDR is running for an unprecedented fourth, fourth yeah. term, which I think us and in Canada forget. It. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, the pressure is put on Ike to make sure that everything is positive yep. in Normandy. Right. Yeah. And the way and then there's a problem with the strategic conception of how they're going to fight or operational conception, probably, of how they're going to fight it. Yeah. Um, basically, Montgomery wants the old bite and hold. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're going to a trit to create the conditions for maneuver. Yeah. Whereas Eisenhower is the opposite. No, maneuver to then cut them off and kill them and a trit them. Yeah. And they just don't see eye to eye. Yeah. They're both talking about the same end game, but they're coming at it from two different perspectives. And this is where I'd say that's the center of gravity of the entire historiographical argument that has raged ever since about mm. who was right, Montgomery or Eisenhower or Patton or whatever else. Yeah. It comes down to a completely different sense of it. And out of this, um, Montgomery seems to understand what is happening. Not sure if, if Eisenhower does. Eisenhower's fed up with Montgomery. Montgomery <laughs> understands it and says, yeah, Ike, I know what you want, but this is not how we play this game. Yeah, this can. is not the way we do it. Yeah. So Dempsey, his subordinate, comes up with the concept of what he euphemistically terms tennis over the Orne. I know. <laughs> which basically means putting on set piece attacks on each side of the Orne River to back the Germans back and forth like a tennis ball. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, while you're doing this, not only are you grinding them down, but you're exposing them as they move to Allied air power. Yeah. And so, again, this is something that has been lost in the historiography. A lot of people don't understand that this is how, where Operation Spring fits. Because to do this, Montgomery realizes there's no way now that one big blow is going to knock open the Germans on Verrier. Right. You need a series of dogfights, bite and hold, like he did at El Alamein, where he started a crumbling process, as he calls it. Yep. And then you're going to put on a series of these attacks, this tennis over the arm, one side or the other. And then you are going to weaken the Germans sufficiently. And then finally, boom, deliver the colossal crack, as yep. you would say. Yeah. And so that's what we're seeing. Operation Spring becomes the first of what would be a series of attacks, or at least in his mind, at least in Montgomery's mind, and Dempsey's mind, and Simmons' mind, what will be these, you know, these attacks. But at the same time, just because things were getting ugly, um, doesn't mean that Simmons was any less ambitious. Um, he understood what it would mean not only for his career, but I think also for the army and for Canada to grab Verrier Ridge, just like Vimy. Mm -hmm. You know, Verrier stood there as a potential Vimy of World War II. And so even though he was supposed to poke the bear uh, and get a reaction, I think for him, he figured, well, you know, getting the ridge, even though you did, didn't necessarily need the ridge if you were just going to poke the bear and then dig in, right. um, would be the ultimate bonus. Yeah. But that wasn't the way it was viewed with Dempsey and Montgomery. No. Because as we see the days approaching July 25th, before the kickoff of Operation Spring, I would say uh, Dempsey more than Montgomery are, are getting, well, I won't say cold feet, because that's, I think that's mm. a I think they're becoming, you know, rational and reasonable <laughs> to what <laughs> could happen on the other side, even to the point of telling Simmons, and this is in the in the documents, it's in the in message logs and everything else, that basically Simmons has only until noon on the 26th yeah. to get Verrier Ridge or they're going to shut this all down because they know, you know, if, if things don't go really well, they're going to go horribly. You know, because that's yeah. how that's how difficult the job is to take. Yeah. It. 
Well, and sorry, we just had that question about it's like a la main because that's that's the idea. Yeah. That's Montgomery's doctrine exactly. and how he comes to this. Sorry, yeah, yeah. we're getting close. We're getting close to the hour mark, so I want to get to the back. Yeah, no problem. No, you're absolutely we, right. We it's like El Alamein. It's El Alamein in Normandy. It's it's El Alamein two point You know. So so I want to get to the actual attack, the actual Black Watch attack, because it's not confusing in the traditional sense like yes it is a little bit because even i've been there like i said i've seen the ground it doesn't look the same as it does then like i've literally spent a good chunk when i was reading this like with google yeah. earth like holding things up being like oh yeah it's much bigger now because there's like literal oh it's not suburbs yeah. but they're little residential chunks that were not there so it kind of throws you off yeah i but, haven't been there in probably about six years and it's amazing uh, yeah, how same. much it's exploded in just in six years yeah, it's crazy how much yeah. is different it is. I mean, the part I have photos that I took. I don't even think I can match them anymore because I think the no. spots are changed. Yeah. So no. anyway, so so we're gonna go. I want to talk about that. So moving the the plan, if we can do that really briefly, and then how we go through there. Because there's the, the again, I can explain it badly, but you can explain it better than I can. But what they're trying to do is yeah. get over the ridge, and what that yeah. looks like yeah okay yeah they're trying to do that what they're trying to do is like i mentioned before they're trying to imperil the first ss panzer division and to do that you need to turn its right its flank so to be able to do that you have to be able to breach the german defenses which are on the crest and just on the reverse slope. yeah and the way simmons has designed this is in a in a multi-phased plan and the second phase of this is the black watch phase yeah. And they are supposed to grab a little town on the reverse slope called uh, Fontenay-le-Marmillon. And next to it, there's another um, uh, a town called Roconcourt. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was the Royal Regiment of Canada from Toronto. Yeah. That was, They were supposed to get that at the same time that the Black Watch picked up Fontenay. Yeah. What this would do would give you two solid shoulders in a breach to squeeze the two armored divisions through. So basically, these are the most important two objectives in the entire operation, are fontenay le marmillon and Rock Encore. So in Simmons' mind, I believe that he's hell-bent. No matter what happens, mm. they've got to try to get those. As a matter of fact, in the plan, something that we never realized, he had already given orders that if the first phase got a little sticky in some of the other towns, that the units that were making the attack on Roconcourt and on Fontenay-le-Marmillon, so the Royal Regiment, the Black Watch, were to go wide and keep going. Mm -hmm. In other words, don't bother getting embroiled in the town ahead of you. Ideally, it'll be in Canadian hands and you can just pass through. That would be mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. But if it's not, your objectives are the most important of the entire plan and therefore go wide and keep going. Yeah. And so that's basically what happens. And that's what leads to the Black Watch going up the ridge in broad daylight. They are trying to, um, they're trying to affect the, the, the plan that was laid down the way it was laid down by Simmons. And right. when the Calgary Highlanders get messed up in the town uh, of Maser Orn, instead of passing right next to Maser Orn, they, they said, okay, well, our instructions are to go wide and keep going. And that's sadly what they end up doing in hindsight yeah i mean yeah i mean it's in hindsight and we can and i do i don't like doing this but i, I want to talk about this part is hmm. because your book centers on individuals and ones that have kind of taken on this it's not mythology but might as well be uh griffin especially i, yeah. I don't want to bash him because i don't think he made the wrong choice and again if you're not sure what we're talking about it's in the book it's kind of hard hmm. to explain but what he eventually but the is, is it really his choice to start with? Well, not even, I guess that's fair. My, my, yeah. Again, I don't want to blame him because I, I understand what, like, abstract. I've never been in combat. I've not been in the army, none of that stuff. Hmm. His decision to leave the HQ and lead in the attack is, you might, you don't even have to answer this if you don't want to, but oh. is that the wrong decision? Uh, under the circumstances, I don't believe because everything was melting down around him. I don't think mm. he had another option. I mean, what are you going to do? Stand there on a smoking radio that's been destroyed and try to get in touch with your companies who are completely out of touch, who are pinned down in a wheat field? I mean, I, I think it, you got to roll back the clock. I think the decision okay. 
that is made to go. And it really isn't, it's kind of by the time Griffin takes over, and for those of okay. you who haven't read the book, um, the Black Watch uh, battalion commander is killed. The guy who effectively works as a second in command is knocked out as well. And there's a, 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 a vacuum of power, if you will, temporarily. Phil Griffin, who is the senior officer, eventually arrives on the scene, takes over. And what I've argued is he's getting no help whatsoever from higher headquarters. Um, Brigade is just basically cracking the whip and saying, get on with it, get on with it, because basically yeah. we have till noon or this is all going to shut down. And he's screaming, look, we have problems here. We have this. We don't have a secured start line. We don't know where the, you know, the Calgary Highlanders are. You know, our timings have been missed. Do we have artillery, you know, support? Yeah. Do we have tanks? Instead of a brigadier coming down and exercising grip, Griffin does this. Mm. Griffin ends up retiming the shoots. Re I mean, he is literally, you know, first of all, he's a company commander operating as a battalion commander who's doing the job of a brigadier. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's remarkable to start with. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, the, some people have said, well, you know, he should have called it off. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, in hindsight, yes. Of of course, yeah. <laughs> At the time, do you really have, you know, with everything there, okay, with every, first of all, nobody at, you know, higher headquarters is listening. No. The whip is out. Um, you're told to get on with it. Um, he is also, and I'm not going to completely get him off the hook here, because he is the kind of character who is extremely intelligent, um, perhaps suffering from a bit of a, a small man's complex, Mm. He wants to prove that he can do everything. He's yeah. extremely arrogant when it comes to intellectually. He believes he's the smartest. He believes he's the best, which is fine. You want a confident commander. Right. Um, but he's one of those ones who would be not so much along the lines of, oh, no, this can't be done. It would be, okay, I'm the guy who can figure it out. Mm. And so that plays okay. into it as well. You add that, you add to that, I should say, the expectations of the Black Watch where you're the one who sets the bar for everyone else in the Canadian army, whether it's true or not, this is what they think of themselves. So as a result, unless there is a legal way, mm. <laughs> legal, moral and ethical way of getting yeah. this, they're going up that ridge come hell or high water because right. they have to, you know, they have to, to be loyal to their superiors Mm. They have to be loyal to perhaps their own egos in some cases, maybe with Griffin. And they have to be loyal to the regiment, the old family name. They've got to keep it yeah. up. So it would be absolutely extraordinary. And apparently, according from the testimony that was there, the other all the officers are trying to search for something. Yeah. In other words, we have a bad feeling. This yeah. is likely not going to go well. But we're under a direct order. And there's nothing legally, morally, et cetera, or ethically that we can figure out to get the hell out of this. Right. And that's the sad part. You know, how do we get into a situation when I say we, the Black Watch, how do they even arrive into that context, into mm. that situation in the first place? So that's why yeah. you really have to deconstruct and go back and say, how do we get here? Yeah, you're right. I mean, I think that's the best way to look at that because that doesn't happen often when it comes to Normandy. You don't that's what it is like you said it's this historiography fight about well you can do it at different levels you can go at the army group level whatever sure. uh, but thinking yeah. about it in that sense because i've been there like i've said a thing a thousand times by now but seeing this ground seeing what it's like and for those of you who don't know at this point when this is happening this is all farm field with wheat mm. that's what six feet tall you get lost literally in it it's like a yeah. scene. you can't see anything other than a few feet in front of you so and again i don't want to ruin the book of that because it's part of i don't mm. know if it's necessarily you're making an argument you know what i mean it's not an academic oh, book it's, it's you know yeah. i don't know you know what i mean you know you wrote it you know what i mean but um well somebody that one of my critics not no critics but somebody one of the reviewers said i'm not sure what o'keefe has against wheat <laughs> <laughs> Eastern, we're Eastern Canada, we hate the wheat. Um, it must no. be. Yeah, it's, it's the Montreal city boy in me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, stupid farms, but uh, <laughs> uh, which I don't believe. I come from farmers. Yeah, go farmers. Uh, but uh, anyway, I think that that's important to to know because depending on when you right. go, it's yeah. it, and again, it's different now because again, crops change. But seeing the ground gives you a perspective. But bringing yeah. that in, I just because I've heard this story so many times, I finally went. I've heard all the things that now I know Simmons did. 
about Griffin, basically yeah. how he set him up when he's dead <laughs> and going, yeah. I still having trouble, you know, like seeing that being him. The only reason I'm saying this is because I guess maybe it's contextual for me because I had just been to second to be, to, to be at Eep at, you know, it's at St. Julian and hearing what Curry did and how yeah. he's still getting crap for that a hundred years later, he did something similar. He just doesn't get killed. Yeah. It, I just couldn't, maybe that's why I can't stop thinking about it. Cause Griffin, I, to me is just <sighs> getting a bit older, but like, cause he's a young guy at this point, youth, right. He makes kind of a youthful transgression, but I think you're right in the way you talk about it. You have to go back. It's not a spur of the moment thing that's happening. It, he doesn't really have the power to make that decision. Yeah. They, he may have the power to say, yeah, we're not doing this. And then he'll be relieved of command and somebody else in the black watch who will be interested in upholding the family tradition will be more than willing to do to do it. Yeah. You know, because there is there is a little bit of that Game of Thrones going on in the sense yeah. that, you yeah. know, being a commanding officer of the Black Watch has a certain swagger to it that everybody in the regiment tends to aspire to in one way or another. Right. And so, you know, he could easily say that, but you know, but I I just don't think Phil Griffin was that kind of character. I mean, I've read, yeah. you know, I've had excerpts from his diaries. I've seen, you know, everything. He was the kind of guy who was just, no, give me a problem as difficult as it is, and I will figure it out. Yeah. And that's essentially I mean, what he does, for better or for worse. Yeah. I mean, um, it, that comes through when you write this, because, again, that's what I was saying. I was thinking about this, like, seeing the ground, because that's what I can try to do in my, you know, my mind's eye, is literally what that would even look like, right? What he's doing. And seeing the wheat and the and I mean those of you who don't know it's when we say barrier ridge, it's not a big ridge. Like, it's not none of these ever are. Right? It's it's yeah. It's not like the guns of Navarone or no, other it's stuff. Not. You know, it's a gentle rise. It's very gentle. Like yeah. I looked it up last night on uh, on Google Street View. I had to yeah. turn the camera to even see the rise. So it's just it. It's really, deadly really deceptive or yeah. deceptively deadly. Put it this and way. then that's what happens because yeah. again I don't yeah. want to we're getting towards at the end of the you know the chronology here but that's what happens yeah. in the book and again the aftermath which most people talk about but it's like a throwaway you look at that and what that means i mean i because i quickly threw your title because i was just being lazy and didn't want to type it out i saw a review that was completely unfair they're saying you're obsessed with people dying i'm like what is this person talking about what do you think war looks like <laughs> yeah exactly so yeah when well, I mean, you go up the ridge and there's 94 percent casualties like what do they think it is every like the bodies in a video game it just disappears like what do they think this looks like maybe i don't maybe. know but anyway so, so that was just yeah. that part really stuck out to me because this ground is important to understand because yeah. it's contained in sort of a way right because that doesn't really happen because if you look at the maps there's the dual you know the two towns as they call them or the twin towns sorry twin towns yeah yeah that form the the flank that they're trying to supposed to go through but they don't and again i don't want to give that yeah. away but it doesn't go well but again no. sorry getting back to to the aftermath i think you really do that in, in a very respectful but important way yeah i felt it was important and, and the only reason i brought that up is because i came across those passages in which were very gruesome um, but they were in the passages from the chaplain's war diaries. Yeah. So, I mean, they felt it was important enough to put it in such gruesome terms, you know? And that, that was something that I felt was important to get across and how difficult it was, like, because a lot of the snipers uh, ended up working on graves registration detail. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. sorry, going a bit back, they also worked as medics. So they, yeah. some of them Stretcher were supporting bearers. the attack. Yeah, but, stretcher bearers. Yeah. Yeah, a good number of them were killed doing yep. this. Yeah, Harold Burden was one of them, and yeah. a couple of the others were killed as well, for sure. But it's, you know, it's it was it's something that I noticed. And, you you know, you've been in the archives. You know what it's like. There's certain things that you read over the years that stick with you. Yeah. And I was never able to shake the passages from the, from the chaplain's reports because I thought, you know what? We never talk about this. We don't. This is the reality of it, is picking up remains of friends three weeks later. You know, that's and I'm sure there's a few people out there who sadly had to do this in Afghanistan. Um, and and that's something that you you don't I guess you won't talk about, but you'll never get rid of. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, that's one thing I noticed with the with the it, 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 vets that I interviewed. They were still carrying the baggage of not just barrier, but their experiences, um, you know, and, and we just don't talk about that, you know, especially mm -hmm. with World War Two. 
Yeah. Because World War II was the good war. So yep. somehow, magically, because it's it was fine. a good war, yeah, you're done. It was fine at the end. Yeah, yeah, VE Day, and you're all good. Yeah, yeah, but it was interesting because when I was doing these interviews and a lot of the other interviews I've done for other documentaries and whatever else I've worked on, a lot of times when you develop a, a good rapport with the interview subject, the better they'll start talking to you and say, mm -hmm. "Well, you know, I'm I'm taking you know medication right now because I still have night terrors." Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, for three years after the war, I crawled into a bottle. I lost my first marriage over it. It was a great woman that pulled me out of it. And, yeah. you know, and the stories continue on and you realize that these poor guys, here they were 70 years later. And we've we've turned them into these heroes and we've put them up on a pedestal. Yeah. A pedestal and, and we tend to forget that they're still suffering. Like yeah. nobody who goes to war comes home and it's over. Yeah, it just doesn't. It just it doesn't, doesn't end with the piece at all. And no, I mean, you you doesn't. weave that through the text in, in a very good way. I wish that I could do that in my own writing. <laughs> Still working on that part of the career, but uh, it, yeah, it's it's something that doesn't get talked about. And I and I think this is important because, like you said, I, I haven't done like formal interviews, but I know a few vets. They'll tell me things I didn't even ask about. So I think it's just it's yeah. it's it's something we have to keep in mind when we're reading this, doing this. I mean, you can think about you know, charging up a hill covered in wheat. But what does that mean for those who live through it or who are wounded yeah. and that also have psychological issues? Because that is one thing I do mm. want to commend you for outright is you talk about in the way you use the word masculinity when you talk about this mm. or, you know, manhood, yeah. but also the issues of well, what they call combat exhaustion. Yep. Uh, or, oh, sorry, battle exhaustion. and you know, battle battle exhaustion. Yeah. 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 Uh, what is now PTSD. And you're yeah. very presenting that in a very good way. I do commend you for that in the book, mm -hmm. but it, it, the way you weave that in, because it makes perfect sense. It's not saying, you know, you have to do this to be a man, but it, it sets the tone that you've started from the beginning, talking about the Black Watch, the culture, the First World War, what that looks like. And, and then right through to the end, when we were just talking about what this looks like for the, the men who live through this. And you yeah, don't stop I, at, at Barrier Ridge either. You take this through, not in yeah. depth, but you talk about those who are like, yeah, they survived Barrier Ridge, then they're killed later. Yeah. I mean, this is the tough part. I mean, you know, I sat down with so many veterans and, and the one that I... I I, I ended up using as the central vehicle, if you will, to pull that thread through yeah. was Jimmy Bennett. And because mm -hmm. Jimmy Bennett, you know, he does survive the war, but he is a, a, a human roller coaster of anxiety and emotion yeah. throughout the entire time. I don't know how the guy did not explode. And he's the guy you are like, oh, he doesn't stand a chance. With the yeah, oh, yeah. You don't. You know he's going to snap. Yep. And he never does. He doesn't. Yeah. And, but he goes as far up as possible, as far down. I mean, he's terrified about losing his eyes the yeah. entire time. And even though I don't think I put it in the book, and it'll, it'll come out in the sequel eventually when I get down to doing the sequel after the next <laughs> book comes out. Well, I'll be um, back to that. But, uh, but he's, <laughs> yeah, so I'll tell you now because it'll be like four or five years and we'll never remember this story. We'll forget. Yeah. But Jimmy was always terrified of losing his eyes. And that was the big thing. Crossing the Orn, his first battle, all he was worried about was his eyes, his eyes, his eyes, losing his yeah. eyesight. And then he gets hit by a sniper's bullet and then hit in the back of the head. And he's hmm. got blood coming out. He's like, you know, this is near the end of the war. And he's like, oh, my God, I'm finished. I'm finished. But um, he um, just witnessed, just before this happened, one of the most horrific incidents where they were out on a patrol and for some reason, they brought up a wasp, which is a Bren gun carrier flamethrower. with a flamethrower. Yeah. And the flamethrower hit his patrol instead. Oh. And three guys were, were lit up. And one of them started screaming and running around. And he was completely doused. And so he was a, essentially a goner. And right in front of Jimmy, as he ran by, this poor guy's eyes exploded because of yeah, the heat. That happens. And right there, I thought, okay, Jim, you, that's it. You're done, right? And for whatever reason, he was just, his greatest fear, right, came to life in front of him. And then somebody else came up and shot the other guy who, you know, was was in horrific misery. Yeah. Um, put him out of his misery. And, you know, right there, you expect Jimmy to completely lose it. Mm. And he doesn't. And it's not like he's calm about it. But at the same time, I mean, he's been, you know, this giant roller coaster of, of mm. anxiety. And it's the same thing when he's trapped in the wheat, you know, yeah. is, you know, what, what are you going to do? 
So yeah. and I thought it was important because, you know, mm -hmm. it, and it's not just you know, throwing some token story in about PTSD. Um, so, all these men, everybody who goes through something like this is battling with the enemy, but battling also with the enemy within, which is yeah. your fear of flight, you know? Yeah, it's yeah, very exactly. yeah and I mean, yeah, I will say that you, you, it doesn't just get tossed in because I've seen this, my own work, I've seen this at Hong Kong. I've seen where it's the same thing. Like this guy's going to lose it or he's going to do something stupid, not purposely and get killed. No, nope, exactly. And then it doesn't happen. I don't know. Is it luck? I don't know. I don't think anybody has an answer. But well, that's it, what veterans have always told me. I mean, yeah. I, I remember sitting down with um, um, Bill Betridge, Boots Betridge from the Queen's Zone who landed on. on uh, oh, yeah. And Boots told a story. He said, look, I was, you know, the, I'm, I'm advancing and three guys with a ladder next to me. And the first guy crosses a landmine, doesn't step on it. The second guy does. It bounces up and just kills the third guy. Yeah. And he said, it didn't matter. All those mm -hmm. years of training, you could be stupid, you could be smart. It came down to fader luck. Yeah. That was it. Just fader luck. All the other training is just, you know, a template that you put on and then somehow it's, you know... I mean, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Yeah. I mean, there's stories in your work, like, again, not trying to give away the end, but the the ones who are stuck in the fields and like what the one guy, it was 16 hours or something. He crawled yeah. back. Yeah. To, that was Jimmy to, yeah. 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 To the, oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I just read that a couple hours ago. It's, uh, yeah. it's just shocking. I don't know what other word to use that this happens. Like, cause again, like you just said, it's random. They're talking about, uh, when the pans, uh, sorry, the panzer tanks come through and are just yeah. like picking guys off, and other guys are not touched. Like it's just, it's so random. Uh, exactly. I don't, know, I, I don't know if that's a good place to end, but uh, we're getting close to the hour and a half mark, so I didn't want to wrap this up. But it's like, yeah, people are saying in the comments, like it's war as hell, and it is. I mean, that's a cliche, but it's just true. This, yeah. And like you said, I, I guess this goes back to what you said at the beginning. There's these darkness. There's this we it's it's bad but we have to know this well it's yeah it's war it's i mean war. <laughs> you know yeah. you, you, it would be irresponsible to sugarcoat it yeah absolutely irresponsible. And, and you know it doesn't mean we have to go out and champion no in this and it doesn't mean every history book has to buy or have the same tone but this story organically demands this you know, mm -hmm. it demands that kind of, of I, tone and, and storytelling because that's the agree. genuine experience of these men. Yeah. Uh, you know, I wish it was rosier. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you know, it's not. But I think that's part of it. I think it, part of the appreciation is understanding, you know, what kind literally what kind of hell they went through for those seven days. And for yeah. the men who either, you know, didn't come out or the ones who did. Um, it really is a test, you know, testimony of their of their particular strengths and or weaknesses of their experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's what history is about. Again, to get back to what we started at the beginning, it's about empathy. It's about yeah. understanding. It's not about, you know, condemnation or this or that. That's secondary. Number one is to understand. Yeah. Be there. Understand what others have gone through before us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think maybe that's a good point. I think that's a good place to end there because, like you said, I agree with everything you're saying here. In my own work, I've done lectures at universities. I, I'm like, I can't sugarcoat this because that's not, that's not how this should be done. I think I did the U.S. Civil War, and I was talking about uh, Gettysburg, and I'm like, I'm not sugarcoating this. This is going to get bad, guys. Mm -hmm. But we have to know this because we have to know, like you said, empathy. We have to understand what's going on. We have to, in my opinion, we have to try and stop this from ever happening again. That's why yeah. I do what I do is to yeah. understand the human elements and trying to stop the awfulness. I mean, yes, my title of all my stuff is Canadian military history, but at the end of the day, these are human stories to me. Yes. And this is why I'm trying to do. We uh, explain, you know, explain Canada's role in these things, but get these human stories across. Yeah. Yes, your book well, is a Canadian really what unit. It is. Yeah. yeah. Your book's it a Canadian unit. It just to be a Canadian down. unit, but yeah. this is not a, specifically a Canadian story. Yeah, so I'm just trying to like, I don't know, it's not I'm trying to be like, you know, I think Paul said yesterday, playing the smallest violin, that's not what I'm trying to do, <laughs> but just trying to say like, sometimes we get lost in the shuffle, but stories yeah. like this, I think have a universal appeal. And this is why I wanted yeah. to do this book on the show, because it, I, I, it's, this one's going to stick with me for, I think, a long time, because of all the things I know, the way you've written it, it's it's amazing. Uh, so I'll again, say for the last time, the book is available for sale at the links below. If you haven't, I, I, like, 
I just I can't say enough about this. Again, no, I'm not trying. No, no offense. I just didn't know much about this book because I've been so busy the last couple of years. I think because it came out only a few years ago, right? In 2018 or 19. I guess. Yeah, yeah, like I mean, that was my busiest time. Like I'm like I'll get to it eventually. And then I read it. And I went, would have I? This was stupid. I should have read this a long time ago. I would have probably <laughs> well, done better yeah, in my own probably. writing with this. But anyway, so I just yeah. think it, it it's a great book. Check it out. I think I have put your uh, Twitter. Uh, down below if you're not following please do yeah. uh, lots of good stuff uh, we get into some good discussions I think you and me have disagreed about a few tiny things with the app which I would like to have you back on the show not to pretend yeah, <laughs> there's just tiny little details that don't matter at the end of the day just so. evidence yeah just evidence. <laughs> it's just fun to talk about half the time but anyway so thanks for coming on I really my really pleasure appreciate. thanks for having me all right so I'm just gonna give a little wrap up and then I'll uh, come say bye so uh, thanks everyone for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this kind of a different show I've done uh, probably for the first time. So I'm going to hope to do more about like this. So this was a really good one um, and a really good topic. So more is coming, nothing over the weekend. Um, we, uh, uh, I have, we have one coming, another book discussion uh, that'll be a kind of a prime time on the Eastern time zone on Monday night uh, with Patrick Dennis talking about um, Canadian conscription in the first world war. So Canadian conscripts, their experience of battle. Uh, so that's going to be a good one. And it's a really interesting book as well. So uh, keep an eye out for that because it'll be uh, Monday night. Sorry, one second. I'm having some technical issues here. So thanks again, Dave, for coming on. I really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for watching. Uh, so please like the video and leave a comment below um, about, uh, about the show and if you liked it or not. So everyone uh, have a good weekend. <laughs>